Good afternoon, everyone. This is the October 12th, 2023 Zoning Board of Adjustment Regular Meeting. My name is Matt Perry, and I'm chair of the board. I will now call this meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll so that we may verify the presence of quorum. Board member Sumikarova will be absent. Uh, board member Callahan? Present. Grants Korsh? Present. Hutchins? Yep. Ingram? Present. Johannesson? Aye. Chair Perry? Here. Softly? Aye. And Wang? Here. We have eight present. So we do have quorum, and with that we'll proceed to our agenda, a copy of which was posted for public access to the city's legislative information management system available at limbs.minneapolismn.gov. Is there a motion to approve this agenda? So moved. It's moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Any against indicate by saying nay. Any abstentions? That motion passes and the agenda is approved. I believe the, all the board members have seen a copy of the minutes from the September 14th, 2023 Zoning Board of Adjustment meeting. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. It's moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Any against indicate by saying nay. Any abstentions? If you were not here at the last meeting, you should abstain. Hutchins abstain. And Perry abstains. And Johan with that, Johannesson abstains. And uh, Johannesson abstains. And with that, the motion passes. The minutes from the Zoning Board of Adjustment, September 14th, 2023 meeting are approved. Mr. Ellis, are there any petitions or communications? Uh, Chair Perry, members of the board, there is one communication this evening. We'll be bringing forth uh, a January and February calendar uh, for the board adoption at the next meeting. Uh, or at least to review, uh, we won't have full uh, for the we won't have for the full year until council adopts its full calendar. Uh, but we're putting together at least a tentative calendar for adoption so that the the work of the board can continue on until council is organized and fully uh, knows which committees it will have. Great, that's good to hear. Um, for board members, new board members, we do um, our annual meeting at the second meeting of the um, January meeting um, of the new year. And that's where we elect officers, so it's good to get the January and February dates out in front of us. So thank you for that update. Anything else? Okay, a reminder to applicants and others, if you're gonna speak at the public hearing, please sign in on the sheet over in the corner and speak clearly into the microphone. If you've not signed in, you can do so on your way out. Also to applicants and others, please contact staff after the hearing with any questions regarding your projects. And let's review the agenda. I will read the agenda number, the address of the project, and state whether it's slated for consent, continuance of withdrawal, return, or the discussion. And I'm just gonna quickly cover what discussion items are. These are items that the board will take public testimony on, deliberate on, and make a decision. After the public testimony has been heard for each particular discussion item, I will close the public hearing for that agenda item. Once I close the public hearing for an item, no additional public testimony will be taken, but staff may be asked to address board questions. And the public hearing for that item is closed. After the public hearing is closed for that item, board members will then discuss and act on motions, and the chair only votes in the case of a tie. So let's look at the recommended dispositions of our two land use request items. Agenda item number five is 2200 4th Street Northeast. This is a discussion item. Agenda item number six is 2021, 2121 Drew Avenue South. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone to speak against this item? And board members can also pull items if they would like. I see no one. That concludes the items on the agenda. So let's review the items on the agenda for consent. There, item number six. Is there a motion to adopt this item on consent? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Any against, indicate by saying nay. Any abstentions? That motion passes. Abstain, Marianne's course. Okay, thank you. So there's one abstention, but the motion still passes. So if you're here for agenda item number six, your land use request is approved. Good luck with your project. Let's move on to our first discussion item. That is item number five, 2200 4th Street Northeast. Ms. Roman. Thank you, Chair Perry, members of the board. Item number five this evening is for 2200 4th Street Northeast. Um, the subject property is a 6,820 square foot reverse corner lot located in the CM1 neighborhood mixed use district. Uh, the lot is occupied by a two story mixed use building um, and a detached garage. Uh, the principal structure on the lot was constructed in 1903. The surrounding area is developed with a variety of uses, including scattered small-scale commercial, um, primarily restaurants, um, clustered at intersections, and low and medium density residential uses. Um, all of the directly adjacent parcels to the subject property are zoned UN1 urban neighborhood district. This is the site plan for the subject site. Um, so you can see in the um, bottom right hand corner, you have the principal structure. On the bottom left hand corner, corner the detached garage and then the um, paver patio where the legally established outdoor dining exists on the property currently. Um, there's also a deck behind the detached garage um, that was constructed as well as uh, a paver patio that was constructed behind the principal structure um, in approximately 2021. So there are three variants, or excuse me, five variants requests before you this evening. Um, so we have uh, several variants requests related to the trellis that was constructed on the property, um, a variance request for the privacy fence that was constructed on the property, and then we have two variance requests related to the outdoor dining that has been um, installed on the property. Um, so uh, during 2021, so during the pandemic, um, the city relaxed our outdoor dining requirements to allow businesses um, to continue to provide services where we weren't having any indoor dining because of, of uh, health risks. Um, during that time, uh, they established outdoor dining at their site. They also constructed a 13.5 foot trellis along the northern property line, um, as well as a six foot tall privacy fence. Um, because of this property's location adjacent to residential uses, there are a number of considerations that a standard commercial lot would not have. Um, so this is a diagram showing what our setback requirements are for this property. So the red boxes are the required reflective setbacks from adjacent residential district boundaries. So for the first 25 feet from a residential property, you have a reflective setback, which means that the commercial property that would typically not have required yards is subject to the same required yards that a residential property would have. Ms. Roman, I'm sorry for interrupting your presentation. So did you just describe what reflective setback means? Yes. So could you go over that again just so everybody is sure. sure of what that is as you're doing your discussion? Absolutely. So where you have a commercial property that's adjacent to a residential property or a residential district boundary, for the first 25 feet from that district boundary, you have what we call a reflective setback. And what that means is that the yard requirements that would be applied to a residential property are then going to be applied to that commercial property. So in this case, the, um, the property to the north has an 8.5 foot setback from the structure to their front lot line. So this subject property would have an 8.5 foot front yard for that 25 feet from their northeast property line south. We also have a required five foot interior side yard setback, which would be standard for a residential lot. Um, and they also have a reflective setback from the property to the west, um, which is, we don't actually have any issues related to variances for the property to the west. They're just being shown so that you understand what all of the reflective setbacks that are applied to the lot include. 
Separate from those reflective setback standards, we also have a required 20-foot setback for outdoor dining from any residential district boundary. So that blue square is showing you the 20 feet from the northern property line that we would prohibit outdoor dining in a commercial property. So in terms of findings for these variances, um, staff found that none of the required findings were met for any of the five um, variances that are being requested by, by the subject property. Um, so for the first required finding, practical difficulties exist in complying with the ordinance because of circumstances unique to the property. Um, so while this is a, a reverse corner lot, um, having commercial properties on corners adjacent to residential is fairly standard for this area of Northeast Minneapolis. And when the property owners purchased the property, it was a commercial property that already had residential, district, residential properties surrounding it. So nothing has changed substantially about this property over time that has made this more strict in terms of required setbacks than when they purchased it originally. Um, in terms of required fencing, um, the property can certainly have privacy fencing and they can have trellises. It's just the height of the required, um, the height of the fence and the trellis that they're proposing that is beyond what we would allow in a required front yard and in an interior side yard. The second finding that the property owner or authorized applicant proposes to use the property in a manner that's in keeping with the spirit and intent of the ordinance. So in this case, staff found that the applicant does not propose to utilize the property in a reasonable manner. So again, while outdoor dining fences and trellises are all permitted in the CM1 neighborhood mixed use district, the regulations surrounding those, those uses are intended specifically to prevent impacts on residential uses. And so for a case like this where we have had um, complaints against the property, where we have had issues with um, neighbors coming into the city saying that they're having problems with noise and with um, and light and things like that, certainly we're aware that these impacts are being placed on residential properties where the intent of code is, is to prevent that. Um, the third finding that proposed variance will not alter the essential character or locality or be injurious to the use or enjoyment of other property in the vicinity. Um, so while the proposed variances are, are somewhat in keeping with the, with the character of the surrounding area, staff found that um, these variances would have outsized impact due to the complaints that we've had from noise and patrons occupying the patio into the evening. Um, and so these would alter the essential character um, and be injurious to the use or enjoyment of property in the vicinity. Um, certainly we can go into specifics about each of the five required findings, um, three required findings for five variances if staff has any questions, but um, I figured I would start with kind of the overall summary and, and answer any specific questions that you might have afterward. Um, so we did receive two uh, public comments for this application. Um, one was uh, in support of the variances being granted and one was showing concerns. Um, for the variances being granted, so supporting staff's recommendation for denial. Um, so as such, staff is recommending denial for all five variances, um, and I will stand for questions. Thank you for your presentation, Ms. Roman. Other questions of staff? Uh, so I saw Mr. Johannesson and Mr. Softley. Was there, Mr. Ingram, did you also have a question? Okay, so Mr. Johannesson. Thanks, Chair Perry, thanks for your presentation. I had read there was some note about a um, city staff member went to visit the site and then discovered these elements in the state they're in. Can you explain that a little bit more for me? Sure. So our um, inspections are primarily complaint-based. Um, so we received a complaint about the outdoor dining um, being located in, in proximity to a residential property, and our inspector went out and visited the property and, and noted um, not only the outdoor dining, but the size of the fence and the trellis that was installed. And, and do we know when that was? Uh, uh, summer 2021. Mr. Softley? Thank you, Chair Perry. Uh, Ms. Roman, I was looking at the, the photos and I wanted to clarify an understanding. The building to the north, is it eight feet away from that alley boundary? So or eight and a half feet? I want to make sure I'm understanding the reflective setback correctly. Um, 
Thank you, Vice Chair Softly. So the required front yard setback is 8.5 feet, and that reflects the distance from the building to their front property line. So the distance between the neighbor's home and their property line, I believe, is 20.5 feet. It's a little bit blurry on the screen. I'm going to jump in. 22 feet. Ask my clarifying question then, too. So thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was not thinking about the 4th Street as, as front in my question. So that helps. Um, how are you accounting for the alley in terms of property lines? Is that a platted alley? Are we talking about as, you know 50% ownership of the underlying land? I mean, where are you measuring these setbacks from? So in this case, there is not an alley present. We have okay. 4th Street Northeast, and we have 22nd Avenue Northeast. And then there's the driveway to the north that's part of the subject property, or the, the neighbor's property. Um, but none of these properties actually have alleys present on them. Thank you. Um, and then I, I have an, a follow-up question just looking about the report submitted by the applicant, and I was wondering if you can answer it. And if you can't, I understand. They discussed the enclosed building requirement. Is it the city's position that there is no outdoor service of any kind allowed in the back of the building at this time? Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Southley. So we do permit outdoor dining as, a, um, as one of the items that is permitted that doesn't require um, compliance with our um, uh, interior. Excuse me. Um, so things like outdoor dining are permitted as an exclusion from the enclosed building requirement. Um, we just have this 20-foot setback requirement if you're adjacent to residential. So for example, this paved patio that they have in between the garage and their principal structure, um, that is all permitted for outdoor dining. Any area that's not blue or red would be allowed to have outdoor dining. It's just those areas that are in blue or red where we would not allow outdoor dining. Does outdoor dining include um, you know, holding a drink in your hand and playing uh, a yard game? I mean, if they set up bean bags in that blue area, would that be a violation of the city code for outdoor dining? So or it would be anywhere where they're providing service. Okay. Um, given that there's an extensive setback and, and the city regulation is what it is, have, has staff explored whether or not um, trees could be planted back there to, to serve as a mitigating impact on, on noise or activity? I'm thinking in line with the trellis, and while the posts are certainly above code requirement, I mean, the, the vegetation is nice, and a, a mm -hmm. substitution could be a couple of trees in the back. Um, and I'm wondering if that's been explored as a, as a condition. Maybe, maybe not. Um, uh, thank you, Vice Chair Softly. So we could certainly um, ask that they provide landscaping. It's not a requirement in code. Um, and they can have a six foot tall fence and they can have the, the taller trellis. They just, um, the 13.5 foot height of the trellis is really the issue there. So, so if it were shortened um, to be eight feet tall in the interior side yard um, and then shortened to uh, um, comply with the front yard setback for that first 8.5 feet. So if they bumped the fence back 8.5 feet, they could have a six foot tall fence. And if they moved the trellises back, they could have eight feet tall trellises. Um, so that certainly provides a, a decent amount of screening um, that would comply with code as it's written. Um, there was a decent amount uh, or substantial amount of um, vegetation that existed on the property um, that they had torn out in order to, to provide um, additional area for this um, patio and to install the fence. Um, so I, certainly something that I think that, that we might be open to, but the code doesn't require. Okay, I have one more question. I'm sorry for dominating the uh, the time here. What would the code have any regulatory impact on using wires extending from a post to the building to guide the growth of vegetation? If I were to extend a cable from the building down to a fence on the side yard. Not outside of the trellis regulations. So we would consider it an open decorative fence. OK, thank you. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Hutchins. Thanks, Chair Perry. Thanks for your presentation. The question I have is, I assume most of this happened to, pr to provide outdoor space during COVID, correct? Mm -hmm. Was that a code change 
or a code blind spot during COVID? How did that legally happen and nothing happened about it? Just curiosity of the mechanism that allowed it now that we're scaling it back. I'm just curious on that one. Uh, thank you, Board Member Hutchins. Um, so Mr. Ellis can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was an executive action that permitted the outdoor dining change. Yeah, so we so during COVID, the, the mayor issued an executive action that modified our outdoor dining requirements. Is there a way to find out what that explicitly said? Did it have a end date that said any improvements done on site has to be scaled back at X date or? Uh, thank you, Chair Hutchins. So, uh, excuse me, uh, Board Member Hutchins. Um, yeah, so, so at the date that the emergency orders were lifted, um, all of those executive actions expired. Um, our licensing staff provided a grace period just to assist property owners with coming into compliance um, over time, but um, with you know it being 2023, it's been a substantial amount of time since those have expired. Thanks, this is my last one. When was the first time the applicant was notified that they were out of compliance, their grace period was over, and they had to be put back into compliance? Uh, thank you, Board Member Hutchins. That was uh, summer of 2021. Thank you. Appreciate it. Are there any other questions of staff? I see none. Thank you. Let's open the public hearing. Uh, and the way we do this is we start out with people who are speaking in favor of the application, in, in particular the applicant. So are you representing the applicant, sir? Yeah, so you can come up in whatever order you want, but one at a time. If you could give your name and address for the record, please. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Pat Dwyer. I'm representing uh, Grumpy's Bar, which is at 2200 4th Street Northeast. My personal residence, do you need that? Just an address. 1701 Madison Street Northeast. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you for considering this, and Sarah's been very helpful through the process. Um, the only thing I'd like to say is uh, the, the genesis of the project was a request from a neighbor to build a fence. And uh, the lilacs on our property were terrible. They weren't secure. They were dying. So they, they needed to be addressed. It had to happen. Um, per neighbor's request, we built a fence that the primary concern was privacy, security. Um, and that's still the primary concern for me. The trellis came later, and the fence was actually built prior to COVID. Um, the trellis came later, but the fence existed, and I believe the trellis system went up 2020, maybe? I, I didn't keep dates. But the trellis system is uh, high, cables run between it, there are posts, and the reason behind that was I planted hops, vines that would be thick, provide shade, privacy, and hopefully a sound barrier to our neighbors, um, which I believe it does. And uh, I like it aesthetically. I would like to keep the fence. Um, I would like to keep the trellis system and uh, a setback is reasonable, and I understand it. I have a security concern with that. If I set back the fence in the front of my property, was it five feet or eight feet? Eight feet um, it's currently flush, which I have security on every night, and uh, that would create a dead zone, an area where people could lurk. Um, and it was that way before when we had lilac bushes that were dying and raggedy and people could hide in those bushes and potentially victimize customers, neighbors, whatever. So that's one of the reasons why it was built flush. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, the main thing I wanna convey is I wanna cooperate. I appreciate you guys taking the time to listen and I wanna make my neighbor happy. Um, and it was built at the request because I wanna make my neighbor happy. I wanna make it look good aesthetically I think it serves that purpose, and I'd like to retain it the way it is. Um, 
so I appreciate your consideration. Any questions? Thanks. Are there questions to Mr. Dwyer? Yes, Mr. Southley. Thank you, Chair Perry. Thank you, Mr. Dwyer. I'm just curious, have you had any experiences where someone has, in fact, been lurking in those bushes and victimized somebody? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, the lilacs were, the lilacs, I don't know how old they were. They existed there before the property, and there were fencing built in, but it was poor. And we had people living in our backyard, and, uh, in, well, it had to be had to be monitored and secured because it definitely was, you get access, you could walk through the bushes, which wasn't good for us. I don't think it was good for our neighbor. Um, didn't make me comfortable at all. So when our neighbor suggested that we build a fence, I was all for it because security and privacy were my primary objectives. Sure, so uh, I have a quick follow-up. You mentioned the, um, the trespassing and I wanted to ask. So describe the trespassing that had happened before you put the fence up and then in what way would um, a code compliant fence not also stop the trespassing? Like why do you need to build the fence you have in order to stop the trespassing? Well, the, the prior trespassing was because we had lilac bushes um, and people could go in there and use the yard for whatever various purposes. And that's usually it was, somebody going back there and doing something we didn't want. Um, the worst incident is if we did have people move in and we did have people living back there. As tragic as that is, I, I can't do it for the safety of my staff and my neighbors. I can't allow people to live in there. So the fence being the height it is and it being secure gives me some assurance that that's, that area is going to be safe and secure for us and our neighborhood. So that was the main impetus. Okay. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Mr. Hutchins. Thanks, Chair Perry. Thanks for your presentation coming down. Did you say there was a fence? intermingled in the lilac bushes that you tore down? Yeah, uh, a description of it. <laughs> so if you imagine lilac bushes and you imagine over years, uh, us, ourselves, and people prior trying to build a fence within those bushes, sure. then the bushes started dying and uh, yeah, you, people could walk right through, yeah. Appreciate it. Can I have a clarifying question of staff? Mm -hmm. Since there was a fence, and he replaced it with a fence. Is there any sort of uh, uh, grandfathered in status, non-compliance? He switched a fence for another fence, same rough height. Would you include the vegetation? Uh, Ms. Roman, do you want to step to the microphone, please? Uh, thank you, Board Member Hutchins. Um, so if the fence were maintained, um, so it was, it was in working order, um, then the fence could be replaced in kind. Um, for a fence that's intermingled with lilacs, it's not being well maintained, um, portions of it are broken, I don't know that we would necessarily establish non-conforming rights for a fence of that type. Appreciate the clarification. One question for the applicant. Mm -hmm. Do you ever try fixing that existing fence? Oh yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, Appreciate it. Between the dying lilac bushes uh, overgrowing. I wish I had a visual, but you can imagine what. But you tried to maintain it. Tried to maintain it and uh, didn't do a good job. So when our neighbor requested a whole new fence, this provided the opportunity to make something that was private, secure, and better. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Johannesson. Get you, uh, you refer to the neighbor that requested the fence. So where's the lo neighbor live in relation to your property? Uh, just north of the property. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else for Mr. Dwyer? I don't see anything. Thanks. All right, thank you. Anyone else want to speak in favor of the application? And sir, if you could, uh, we've, we already have written testimony that we have, we already have written testimony. And Mr. Dwyer has made comments, so if you could not repeat either one of them, keep your comments to new subjects, it would be appreciated. Sure. Thank you. Um, my name is Wynn Curtis. Um, I represent Mr. Dwyer and uh, his entity that owns the property at 2200 4th Northeast. <clears throat> and I, want, uh, to, I wanted to address the um, staff report and some of the matters that were in the staff report. Um, because they go together, I'm, uh, I'm going to skip for now the first two that deal with the trellis. We'll, I'll talk about those in just a minute, a little bit. Um, uh, 
but I wanted to start with the one that is the variance request for the privacy fence in the front from three feet to six feet. First of all, there's no such thing as a three foot privacy fence. I mean, you can step over it. It's not a privacy fence. Um, the, there's a, with regard to the variance question about whether there's a um, unique circumstance of the property, there is in fact a unique circumstance of the property. It does meet that zoning, or that does meet that variance request. It's not just a reverse corner. It's a reverse corner where the primary structure is stuck right in the corner. It's right on the lot line on both the south and on the east side. That in and of itself, because of the way then that um, zoning ordinances have evolved, has created all kinds of little crazy things. So you talk about the property to the north and the reflective setback. What is the purpose of it? The, the purpose of the reflective setback, all it does in this particular case is create an L. It would create an L for the first 25 feet and then you could pop back out and you could um, and put your fence. It doesn't serve the purpose and it's because of the nature of the, um, the property. The idea of the fence, of course, is privacy and security. So if my client wanted to have the fence without, um, or wanted to have the fence on his property line, uh, which is where it is right now, he'd have to have a three foot fence or he could have a four foot fence if it, you could see through it. Well, that, neither of those things are private or secure, they do nothing. So his penalty for that is that he has to move his fence eight and a half feet back for no reason other than because of the, look, because of the kind of property that he has. What, is that, what does that eight and a half feet do? Building to the north is taller than my client's building. Um, so it doesn't, it's not blocking the height of that building. Um, there's a reference in the, um, in the notes about the fact that there used to be hedges uh, in the front, on that front yard that were taller than the fence. Well, if sight lines are a concern, how tall can those hedges be? 10 feet, 20 feet? Um, count, or a member asked about trees. Um, so the, the idea that, that putting the fence out on the property line would somehow um, uh, interfere with sight lines, not true. It's not gonna have anything to do with sight lines because he could build a, he could, put, he could apparently put something taller than that um, to block sight lines. There are references in the, um, in the staff report to the fact that um, what you could do is actually build on the property. So instead of just having a fence that presumably would allow you this idea of security and things or privacy, you can't do that, but you can build and make a bigger um, business there, which is interesting because of course, m many of the comments in the staff report are that we don't, that are, are that the plan is to not expand commercial uses. And yet one of the, one of the options is to expand a commercial use by building a bigger building. Um, the, so the um, essential character um, question of whether it meets the essential character question, without ratting out other businesses, there are half a dozen businesses um, that have exactly the same setup. They have fences, bars, or other kinds of commercial places that have fences right on the property line, right next to their neighboring residential thing. And it's only because someone in 2021 decided that they were complaining about the noise, not the fence, not anything else, but noise, that all of a sudden now these things are an issue. So it's certainly not interfering with the essential character of the neighborhood that already has half a dozen of these. Um, with regard to the um, with regard to the 20 foot uh, space that doesn't allow dining. Um, you have in your, in your, in the materials that you got, you have um, the setbacks diagram, which shows that particular space. It's interesting because one of the things it says is that this is an expansion to attract and maintain a patron base, as if that's a bad thing. This is a business. Of course they want to attract and maintain a, a patron base. That's the whole point of having a business. So apparently that's a bad thing in terms of um, this particular site. If you do the math, and it's pretty easy. If you do the math, if you impose all of the requirements that are requested by, or if you deny these things, you're essentially imposing a requirement that prevents this property owner from using 37% of his property. Um, 
the blanked out space represents 37% of the property that can be used. And um, you asked, can they do um, something in the backyard other than serve, serve food in that space? No, apparently not. Because they serve food over here, where they're legally allowed to serve food, they're not allowed to do anything else in this space. It becomes completely useless unless apparently if they build a building on it. That seems to be not, in, um, uh, not exactly in the character. It's an allowed use. Outdoor dining is an allowed use. There's no denying it. It's already there. It's, there's legal parts there. It's all over the place. So it's obviously an allowed use. One of the, it's under, our understanding is that the complaint was that it was a noisy at late at night. That's what, the, and that's all we know. That's what's in the staff report. Well, the answer to that isn't to shut down half the business outside. The answer to that is to say, okay, maybe you, if you have a out, if you have a, a allowed have um, outdoor dining, maybe you don't have outdoor dining after 10 o'clock, or maybe you know whatever other normal and reasonable restriction, but not to say, okay, now you're done. You've been doing it for two years. Now you're completely done. Um, The, um, so with regard to the 20 foot, the request is not to use the entire 20 feet, the request is to change it from 20 to five. So it's sit inside the fence, uh, or in, inside the fence on the north side, inside the side yard fence. It would be a little bit, um, allowed to be a little bit closer than it otherwise would, but it would allow there to be um, some reasonable use of the property that apparently is otherwise can't be used. Um, I want to just go back to the question about the complaint. There's a complaint about noise, but there's already outdoor dining there. We don't even know if the complaint is based on the legal use of the property as opposed to the objected to use of the property. So again, we're here for something based on what is apparently um, one person's complaint, um, which is now going to use up 40% of some guy's business. The last, or the third one is about reducing the setback in the front yard from, or it's actually the setback for um, dining from eight and a half feet to zero, which essentially reflects the fence. If you allow the fence to be out on the property line instead of pushing it back eight and a half feet, that's eight and a half feet where you could actually put a table or whatever it is that you're gonna put there. So it is, again, um, consistent with, if, you're, if there's not an objection, if there's not a reason to not have the fence at the property line, um, then there's not really any reason to not allow the use of that property. Otherwise, if you're not going to let them use, use it, there's not much benefit to having the fence at the property line. So because we think, and it's our position, that the, proper, that the fence should be out at the property line, um, it, it follows logically that then you should be allowed to use that property. Otherwise, it's again, just taking property from the business owner and preventing him from using it in any meaningful way. And in that section again, there is a comment from staff that says, well, you could instead, uh, putting your table out there, you can instead just build a building, you know, expand the building instead. Well, that's completely inconsistent with the whole idea, the whole argument in the other part that says we don't want to expand um, commercial uses. So if you can do one commercial use and be expanded, what difference does it make if you can do a different commercial use in exactly the same location for exactly the same use? That, so that logic makes absolutely no sense. Um, I want to just touch briefly with regard to then to the trellises. The trellises are kind of an interesting situation because they're presumably tied to the idea of how high is the fence. And let me just I do an aside for Member Hutchins. You had asked about that side fence. The side fence itself is legal. I think the I don't think there's an argument that the side fence height is legal. That's not really the issue on the side yard. The side yard is the, is the trellises. So if you were concerned about whether that was somehow there needed to be a ground for it, that fence is six feet high. That fence is okay. The where that fence particularly is. Um, but the trellises are a little interesting because they're there to serve the purpose of privacy and um, noise reduction, and you can't grow hops 
eight and a half feet, or I mean, the, they grow 20 feet high. Um, it's a plant. It's just a support for a plant. Um, if you put it somewhere else, you know, in the in the property, because it's it, would that be okay? Flagpoles can be 35 feet high. What, so it doesn't. It, it's not really a something that makes a whole lot of sense in terms of why it would be um, why it would be a problem, why it would somehow be something inconsistent with the use of the property to allow it to be taller, if in fact what it is is doing. Um, screening noise and sight from the neighbors. I wanted to also make a comment. There was a question about the, I, I think you asked a um, member selfly about the, you asked about an alley, but the question or the idea was there is a 22 foot space from the property line to the north house, the residence. So if you impose the 20 foot, you can't use your, your 20 feet to your property line. There's another 22 feet beyond that. So basically it's a 44 foot noise um, barrier, or whatever it is that the purpose of that is. But I guess the point is it's 22 feet already there. Um, and so there's nothing that says 20 feet has to be because if the other, if the house is right on the lot line or close to the lot line, it doesn't expand that 20 feet. It says it's 20 feet. Well, if it's already 22 feet away from the property line, it's already got the barrier that you're seeking to have with regard to that 20-foot um, zone of not having dining um, next, to the pro next to the residential property line. So by giving it 15 feet, which is what the ask is, you still end up ending up with 27 feet in between there and the residence with a fence and uh, perhaps other things, trees or the or the um, if allowed the uh, the hops things to further um, shelter that um, those properties from each other and to diminish the noise and to diminish the site. As you said, the, we already have submitted something in writing, so I'm going to not go through each one of the um, criteria with regard to the um, variance, but it would be. Um, it would be our, my client's position and our position that there is a unique situation with regard to this particular property not caused by this, pro this owner. And that is the fact that in 1903 they built it where they built it. And since then, um, built upon uh, the city's zoning ordinances has created problems not anticipated when that property was bought, not, not anticipated when that property was built, not anticipated when those businesses were used. And um, it's not reasonable to say that that property is um, now later subject to changes that make it half usable. Um, so we would ask that the um, we would ask that you grant all of the variances um, as they are. Uh, I don't know, frankly, whether you have the ability to grant the variances in modified forms, but um, if that's the case, you know, and you can give. Some of that we would um, we would consider whether that was feasible from from the standpoint of the client, but it's our position that all of those variances are within your authority to to give under the standards that the law um, allows and requires. Thank you. Are there any questions from Mr. Curtis? Yes, Mr. Southley. Did you have a question? Thank you, Chair Perry. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you you started to talk about the unique circumstances to the property, but what I didn't hear was a legally justifiable unique circumstance. Help me understand what it is about the property that requires us to find a unique circumstance for why you can't have a 13 and a half foot tall trellis, or why you need to have a six foot fence in the front yard, and that's any different than any other property on the block or any other commercial property on the block? Like, where's the uniqueness? Sure, so the uniqueness is that this property sits smack in the corner on the lot lines. And so because it does, it's subject to the idea that it's, and because it's next to a residential property, it's subject to, um, it's subject to restrictions that are not uh, applicable to other commercial um, 
entities and other commercial properties. The, the problem is that the imposition of those um, standards, if you want to call them that, or ordinance or regulations on a property in that in this location essentially means that that property is 40% unusable for no particular reason other than its location. Let's put it this way. If, sorry. If the, prop, if the building was on the other side and it was up in the other side of the, um, of the lot, it wouldn't have this problem. It's the location of the building on this lot that makes it unique and makes it uniquely susceptible to the imposition of those ordinances that restrict its use. That's what, now, that, from my standpoint, so with regard to the front fence, it could have the fence if it, if it could have the fence if it was in a different location because it wouldn't be, sub, the reflective, um, the reflective thing only applies to the first 25 feet. So if the building was on the other side, you could do something different. Um, but it's not, it happens to be exactly where it is. I'll be honest, I can't say that, that having a trellis is something that is necessarily unique. A trellis isn't probably something anybody thought of. But I think my point is that, with regard to all of them, is that the uniqueness of the location of the building makes it, you, it makes it, like I said, uniquely susceptible to these particular, um, the imposition of these ordinances on this particular property. And the trellis, again, you asked the question about whether you could have a tree, right? So you could have trees that were 50 feet tall. What difference would it make if there's a trellis there that effectively does the same thing? Um, you know, it's not attached to the fence. It's just a freestanding pole, and it has something tied up to it. So, um, so from that standpoint, the, it's, it, there's no really a distinction between what you could do um, in other ways to affect the same, uh, the same issue. But I, I be honest, I, with regard to the trellis, I'm not sure that I can uh, make the same argument that the position of the building matters. It just compounds the problem of the position the, of, uh, of trying to do something with regard to um, creating a, a barrier or creating that kind of um, that kind of separation from the residential thing that um, it wouldn't that you wouldn't have if the building was in a different location. All right, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wang. I actually have a staff question. Yeah. Um, so if we're looking at where Grumpy's is, and if we're looking at all of the divisions for the different zoning, and that where this um, commercial property is, and kind of how it segments off to the right or the northeast side, but then it's also surrounded by two residential properties. So how would the variances, how would these requests look different if the property was, let's say, um, over where it's uh, 3047 22nd Avenue Northeast, for instance? Uh, thank you, Board Member Wang. Um, so, Because this property is situated on the corner, we do have the reverse corner requirements um, with the residential to either side. So if you were looking at a property um, that didn't have buildings facing uh, towards both directions, although it looks like, so for example, 401 4th Street Northeast across the street, that's not a reverse corner lot. And so that wouldn't have um, the same issue as, as being a reverse corner here, although the reverse corner setback for, for the property to the west is not impacting um, this proposal. Um, however, for all of the other corner properties in this uh, quadrant, um, those are all reflective, uh, or excuse me, um, those are all reverse corners, and so they would have the same standards applied to them. Thank you. Anyone else have a question, Mr. Hutchins? Thanks, Chair Perry. Uh, the outdoor space to the north, it's used for dining now. What was it used for prior, and when did that start? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it wasn't used prior. What was it? It hung laundry out there to dry. 
literally, it was fenced off, it was not accessible, except if you creep through the lilac bushes. So it was, it was fallow, it, was, it wasn't being used at all. Okay, thanks. I have a follow-up question. Are you the owner? Yes. How long have you been in business? Since 1998. And you've been able to live with the, require, the restrictions that existed until COVID came along? Yeah. Um, okay. It, That's all I have. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? I have a question for staff. Yeah. Um, Another question for staff? Um, do you know the number of complaints that have been raised with your property? Was it one? Was it multiple? Was it from the same person? Multiple people? Uh, Board Member Callahan, I do not. I do not have that record. I, it's certainly something that we could pull and we could find out, but I do not have that information with me at this time. So I have a follow-up question for staff. So w this happens a lot to us. We have a situation where maybe one, maybe two people complain. Staff goes out because it's a complaint-driven system, and, and that's just the nature of the way the city operates on uh, all of its zoning stuff, pretty much, unless it's a new build. And then they find out that certain requirements are not being met that have nothing to maybe do with the, the uh, original complaint. That doesn't nullify those requirements in any way, does it? I mean, uh, that's the thrust of Mr. Curtis's argument. Uh, I'm sorry for speaking for you, but it seems to me that um, because some people complained, this person isn't able to allow to, to use their property in the way that they would like to use it, even though they didn't use it that way for many years prior to this. So my question is, isn't this sort of a typical situation where one or two people maybe complain and then that triggers a site review and the, the rest of it is unfortunate that requirements are not being met? Uh, Chair Perry, that's correct. So when the inspector goes out and visits the site related to the complaint, they are inspecting everything that they're able to see when they do that inspection. So if they see other portions of code that are not being complied with, um, then that uh, code enforcement official is required to issue citations for all of the, the portions of code that are not being complied with. Right. So I don't particularly like the system the way it works. Um, but I don't think it is practical to, to have a system where every site is inspected all the time. So we're in this situation where that's the way things work today. So that's my two cents on that. Mr. Hutchins, Mr. Ellis. Uh, Chair Perry, members of the board. I would like to discuss, this is a little bit differently. Due to the mayor's decree, during, during COVID, a lot of businesses expanded their outdoor activities that ordinarily would not have had it because that was necessary and it was you know, something that the mayor did in order to help keep businesses afloat and you know, we supported that. Business licensing did keep a tally of things. So regardless of, on this case, whether there had been a complaint or not, there was a complaint. Um, business licensing also was aware of the ones that had done the expansion of premises. They required that expansion of premises and where ones were not in compliant with the zoning code, upon expiration, that was to be pulled back. And so there were other, you know, there have been other situations similar to this um, where they removed it. Um, maybe others have applied for variance. I can't think of one recently, um, but, you know, and certainly the remedy for them to keep this is the variance application, and so that's why they, they proceeded forward with it. Um, but that, just to, just to be clear on this case, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's out of enforcement, but it's not kind of the same sort of standard one that you see a lot of the, you know, somebody complained this was kind of an organized one where, you know, the city did keep tags on, on these, so. Oh, okay, so I stand partially corrected. In, yeah, in I mean, you're, where everyone's correct, I just want to, you know, be clear that, um, you know, I mean, one of the things that created this sort of situation was, you know, the expansion of premises as a result of COVID. Um, who knows yeah. if anything would have happened without COVID having, I mean, they may have continued to do it. Maybe they would have expanded also. I, I, it's hard to say that's a different sure. universe, so. Okay. Thank you. Do you have something else you'd like to add? 
comment about that. If and I could you speak it. into the microphone so it's, we can hear you? Try not to hit it again. Two things. One, I, my, my point is not woe is my client. Um, my client, I think, is entitled to or is, qualifies for the variance. My, my point isn't, you know, you should do it because, you know, somebody complained and that's not a decent basis for enforcing it. We, you should enforce it. But I, it's our position that under the standards for the variance, he and the business should receive the variance. Um, my point with regard to that comment is simply that I think it should be taken into consideration because what this, what this basically does is that if someone hasn't complained about another business, my client is then put at a disadvantage. And so I think that that's a really lousy way to, for that to be handled. Um, I don't know that it necessarily weighs legally one way or the other, but uh, my, but again, my point is not that it's what what was my client you know feel sorry for him and give him a break. My point, I, our position remains that um, we meet the standard for the variances, and that's the basis upon which it's sure. granted. Okay, thanks. Is it? You have another question? Sure. Thanks, Chair Curry. For staff, actually. Oh. Uh, Looking at the property itself, it does it does seem unique to me in the sense that the in that part of town, there's a lot of commercial buildings that are on the corner in residential areas. I'm trying to ha I'm having a hard time thinking of any of them that are plastered to the outermost property lines and have all of that open unused space around it. I can't. I've been trying to think, walk through the whole neighborhood in my head. I cannot think of any other ones. So it does feel pretty unique to have a very undeveloped commercial lot with its only developed portion way into the corner with very little development around it. That's just, am I off base? Can you set me straight? Uh, Board Member Hutchins, certainly we see a variety of built form in Northeast. And so in our commercial clusters, it is fairly common to see uh, reduced setbacks, zero lot lines similar to this property. Um, the majority of the buildings are slightly larger than what exists on the subject property and don't typically have the uh, square footage of accessory structure that exists on this property. Um, but certainly, like for example, if it were to be redeveloped, it, we would still have those reflective setbacks, like the five feet from the interior side property line and the 8.5 feet from the front on the eastern side. Um, so there would still be, uh, a, a, and with being in the built form uh, interior two district, there would still be a, a, a certain percentage of space that would be required to be open on the lot. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, would anyone else like to speak in favor? Would anyone like to speak against? You would? Yes, ma'am. If you could uh, come to the podium and give your name and address. My name is Carrie Pickett and I'm at 2208 Northeast 4th Street. I'm the neighbor and <laughs> it's, um, it's hard to be here, but I really appreciate this opportunity to address you all and to have this issue discussed in a proper way. Um, I bought my house uh, next door, and so I got it a few years before um, Pat bought his, and it was Zerbies, and there was no outdoor activity at all for years, and then things changed when people couldn't smoke inside anymore. And so then once people couldn't smoke inside anymore, then the patio area was developed so that there could be a place for people to smoke and drink outside. And um, as you can imagine, that's a really popular combo pack. And so I just also wanted to say that um, all of this has been discussing outdoor dining, but it's really not outdoor dining because this is not a restaurant. This is outdoor drinking and smoking and everybody loses their ability to understand their um, level of discourse and volume with the more they drink. It's just kind of a 
scientific thing that happens. I can't explain it, I'm not a scientist, but it sure seems like that, that, you know, um, it's, I'm more here because of that 20-foot setback. I wanted to say that I first found out about the 20-foot setback from my neighbor. I'm a duplex owner, and so my house is also my business, and I really need to have a quiet enjoyment opportunity for my neighbors and our yard. And so the house is setback from... Um, the fence, but my yard isn't, and our enjoyment of the yard is two feet from where people are drinking and discussing and having a really great time. And um, I started uh, calling the city in 2015, and um, that's when I got a zoning map that really laid out to me the 20-foot um, variance requirement by businesses, and it's not just this business, but by all businesses to provide for the quiet enjoyment of their neighbors. And so I've, um, when Pat, Pat's had the ability to have permitted events and has had permitted events, we have hundreds of people in that backyard for music events. And um, I was the person who requested the fence because I felt so unsafe with the amount of people and the amount of noise and the amount of everything in the backyard. And Pat assured me he wouldn't take down the lilac bushes. And I got back from being out of town and the lilac bushes were gone. And the lilac bushes, the noise mitigation, it was still an issue even with the lilac bushes, which were probably four or five feet thick. and. 10 feet high, and um, I didn't really see them as dying, um, I, but I'm not a botanist, so I don't know. When you look at the picture in, in, in the zoning application, they look pretty healthy to me. But I, I, was, I felt unsafe because there were just so many people in the backyard, and everybody could see me, and I could see them, and... Um, as Pat mentioned, there was um, people going through the bushes because he had ticketed events in his backyard where people have to pay to listen to the music and to be in the backyard. And so then people would want to go through the bushes to avoid the fee. And so that was, that was an issue. Um, uh, I feel really strongly about the 20-foot um, setback because of something about the way the noise works. I mean, it is just, there's, it amplifies and it's just really, really loud. And during the COVID time, it became like unbearable, I would say, just on a, to live there. There was just many, many times when I thought, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be able to stay here. And I love my home more than anything I have to say. So. I, you know, I really appreciate Pat trying to do the trellis and trying to figure out some way to replace the loss of those lilacs. Um, I, 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 the fence has blown down in portions a couple of times already. I have no idea if the 13 foot adds to any issues there or not. I really can't comment about that. I, I, I knew about the eight and a half foot um, setback, but because on the front, on that 4th Street side, um, to, that the fence is supposed to be in line with my house, um, but the bushes always were kind of blocking the way, so I've always sort of been used to the bushes, but the part of the reason that the, if the fence was put back to the eight and a half foot mark, it would be a lot safer for the um, tenants, for myself and the tenants to back out and not hit pedestrians, because there's no sight line like once you hit your your car starts as soon as the, you know the fence and the and the, the um, sidewalk are right there so it's i mean i i don't know i try and back into my driveway so that i can see people better but it does feel really unsafe um with the sight lines and that would be the only reason i would say well the eight and a half foot setback from um the 4th Street side would be super helpful, but um, I would say that part of the unique aspect of the building being on, right on the corner means that the amount of people that can be put in that backyard is 
quite a lot because it is a big space. And so um, it's been my understanding that Pat has permitted events there and he can pull a permit and have an event and he's not, he doesn't have to stop his business in there. He can have those permits. I don't know, I think he's allowed a certain amount every year and so it's not like, it's not like he hasn't been using that. He did use it, he's had music concerts in the backyard the whole time that he's been there. Um, when Pat has an event in the backyard, he puts flyers out and he lets us know it's gonna happen and he says, if you have any concerns, please call me directly. And so in the beginning, um, when the noise was, even just on the patio, was just kind of a new thing and kind of loud and, you know, um, happy birthday at midnight is a very popular song at the bar. And so, you know, there were times in the beginning where I would call the bar directly. And um, I would say that the staff, you know, is busy and that I don't know. I, 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 I gave up on calling the bar, um, really, because that just didn't seem to work so well. So, um, I, you know, I have been calling before COVID, and um, like I said, I found out about, I got the map from the zoning people in 2015. And so every time I, I you know, look at that, I just think about, um, the fact that it it's the zoning is there for a reason, and so I just want to say that I concur with the recommendations of your zoning staff to deny the permits. I I don't have a, a feeling about the trellis. I really don't know about the trellis. I I was concerned, and I mentioned my concerns to Pat that the fence he put up is not so private in that people can see through the slats into my yard, and I can see into their yard and so it's there's a barrier there but it's not it's in its privacy fence I would say it's a privacy fence but it's not totally private and so that's fine I mean it's a little weird when you can see each other and you're having a event in your backyard and everybody's in the backyard but it's just right there I mean people are right up on the fence and it's um, just a real loss of privacy for um, those of us who live in my house. And so, uh, I don't know, I guess I really hope that the um, right for us to have a quiet enjoyment of our yard is respected and I really respect Pat, I really like Pat and, you know, I think um, that, you know, I, I feel like I've been super good about all the great big huge events and like so loud and my windows rattle in my house. You know, like the, the glass vibrates with the noise and the um, music. And I, you know, I'm fine with that I, because it doesn't happen all the time. And so I'm not asking that he never be able to use the backyard, but I think on a regular daily basis, um, the patio that he's been using seems really like sufficient to me. But I, you know, if I had a chance to fivefold my clientele, that would be very attractive. I understand his desire totally. And so. Thank you. Um, unless you have something else to add? I, uh, I wrote a letter and so. Uh, yep, that's we, it. We got that. So thank you very much, Ms. Pickett. Thank you. Thanks for coming down and giving testimony. All right, would anyone else like to speak against this? I hear no one, see no one. So let's close the public hearing board comment. I have a comment. Yep, Ms. Uh, Wang. So at this current stay, I do support staff findings for the most part, but what I'm having difficulty with is D and E. So anything related to the outdoor dining. What I don't understand is when we're talking about intensification of commercial use, I see that go hand in hand with increase in density, whether that's residents, certain pockets of the community, whatever that looks like. The other thing that I'm also trying to like reconcile in my head about what 
it would mean for the three findings is this particular property, unlike the other commercial properties in the corridor and also adjacent to the corridor, you have residential properties to the north, east, and essentially the south and the west as well. So it's this unique pocket that has been set up by zoning and it's almost as if the owner just has the unfortunate disadvantage of having it in that area versus a, another part of the commercial corridor or a, another reverse corner lot. So that is my comment. Thanks, Ms. Wang. Mr. Johannesson. Thank you, Chair Perry. Um, I'm, I'm starting to think hard about the challenges unique to this property and the placement of the building. I, I tend to agree with some of that discussion. And I feel like if, if the building was built to the north property line, um, most of these issues wouldn't exist. Um, if anyone's been on 4th Street and I've been to any of these establishments that we've talked about earlier, it's very consistent. Um, they all have outdoor areas. Some are tight to the street, some are away. Um, but I'm, I mean, I'm not for, all for the pergola. I disagree with the argument that the pergola needs to be 35 feet. If it was eight feet, I've seen plenty of eight foot pergolas with hops growing on it. I have neighbors that do it in their garage. Um, but I, I feel like I'd like to grant these variances to them because I feel that, that the uniqueness of the building's position on the property establishes a challenge for the owner. Okay, thanks for your comments. Ms. Grand Gorsh. Um, I'm very concerned about uh, the location of the property and, and its close proximity to the health and safety of somebody's residential. So I'm struggling uh, with D in the sense that have we ever uh, allowed a variance but made restrictions that, for instance, it, it ceases operation at 9 o'clock at night? Because I am sensitive to what the uh, residential neighbor can said, and I'm wondering if we've ever done something like that where we've approved it with the condition that it is closed at a reasonable hour. Mr. Ellis, can you address that? It sounds like a conditional use permit to me. Uh, Chair Perry, Board Member Granskorsch. We have in the past, although that was when hours of operation were regulated by the zoning code, since about 20, well, I th believe it was 2011 or 2012, uh, hours of operation were moved to licensing. And so that would be have to be some form of a licensing restriction and wouldn't be something tied out of the, the zoning approval. Thank you. Any other comments? Mr. Safley? Thank you, Chair Perry. Um, I guess I agree with Mr. Johannesson on a lot of it, except I, I am struggling with the idea of the variance on the front yard fencing. I mean, I, I think a three-foot fence accomplishes the goals, and I think it meets the code, and I don't see why privacy is um, such a uniquely important issue for this establishment. Um, and I generally don't think that we should be putting a six-foot fence along the, the street frontage on 4th. Uh, that said, it, considering you can, and Mr. Roman, shake your head or nod your head if I get this wrong, but it seems like on the side yard, we can go six feet all the way to the front property line because of the orientation of the front of the building as a zero lot line. Setback 8.5 feet. Okay. Um, I do think we should have a six foot fence along the northern property line. I don't think we should allow a six foot fence on the street frontage. Um, and I think that in the absence of, you know, the absence of vegetation on trellises with hop plants is gonna, ha in the winter time, those plants are gonna shrivel and die. And we have extended periods in the spring and in the late fall where there won't be any, you know, coverage to mitigate the noise. And that's where I had an envisioned um, a beer garden sort of setting where you would plant trees in the interior yard. But it sounds like that doesn't work for your operation. But that's what I had in mind when I asked the question earlier about trees as a mitigating impact on the noise. An understory tree can soak up a lot of, uh, of noise. So those are my comments. I'm rambling now. I'll turn off the microphone. Other comments? Thanks to those comments. Mr. Hutchins. Thanks, Chair Perry. Uh, 
I would also echo a lot of what uh, Board Member Johannesson said. I think the trellises, I can't get behind. I can't find anywhere forward on any of those findings. But on the C variance, the building's location, being commercial, tight to the corner, with all that unused space around it, seems like a shame and very unique to that kind of property, especially in that neighborhood. Otherwise, you see the building going from lot line to lot line, filling the entire space, as many as I can think of. I, that's just very unique about that space. I would argue he was essentially replacing a fence on the front, uh, so I, I feel like there's some space there when it comes to practical difficulty. He was replacing the existing fence. Uh, and it's a commercial piece of property wedged right next to a residential property, but you can't use the zoning code as its own um, hindrance. But I think there's enough there. And the spirit of the, the spirit of keeping the fence three feet tall is to not have a gigantic barrier between police, the public, and creating a safe space that they can see into the yard. That's not what the spirit is about a bar having a side yard that's fenced in. I think that's completely outside of what the spirit of the intent of the ordinance is. So I would say it, it lives fine inside the spirit for finding two. Finding three, uh, does it match the area, area of the locale? I would say that neighborhood's full. It's Northeast Manhattan, it's full of bars. It's full of people walking around outside at night. I would say that it absolutely matches the character of the, of the neighborhood. Whether, whether you take the fence away, you make it three feet tall, and you bring them all into compliance, people are gonna make noise in that area. Just, it's just a fact. So the, the character and the spirit or the locale of that area is just gonna happen, whether you do zoning compliance or not on this one. So I would say A and B, I can't find my way forward, but C, I can, I can for the reasons I stated, I think I could get, all, get forward on. Um, uh, the D variance, the allowing outdoor dining within 20 feet of a residential district. I'm having a hard time with that one if anybody wants to help out on that one. Mr. Softley? Well, I don't know if I can help you, but you refreshed my memory about what I, what I blacked out there. Is, uh, I have concerns about the potential redevelopment in the future of the northern property and how that would be impacted by reducing that 20-foot um, setback. Um, the variance runs forever, so we just don't know what that's going to look like. And maybe it ends up being a you know relatively large multifamily building, and it turns out to be a non-issue. But uh, maybe it turns out to be an ADU instead, and we still have sort of the, the privacy and the quietness that that the resident might need. And that's what the ordinance is there to protect. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Safley. Mr. Engram. Thank you, Chair Perry. Um, I completely agree with uh, what was said about uh, variance D. I think that economic concerns is the biggest factor in why that would be staying. And yeah, any redevelopment of the property that we can't speak in the future, like the property line is what it is. Um, and so I, I don't think I can find that one. So I'm going to make a recommendation uh, because uh, it is We've had a lot of discussion on this and a lot of testimony. And I think what we should do is maybe take these a couple at a time or one at a time. It sounds like there are findings for C, at least by some of the board members, variant C. So I would suggest that we tackle that one first. The um, A and B are the trellis. I would take those as the next one. And D and E sort of are in the same flavor. So I would take those together as well. Anybody have any complaint with that? OK, so let's talk about C. Does somebody want to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Sure. Uh, notwithstanding staff findings, I'd like to move forward and grant variance C based on the Findings for number one, the building's lot, the building on the lot location with the empty space around it, coupled with uh, they were essentially replacing the fence, and it actually increases safety having the fence up to the property line and not creating the alcove, the dark alcove in a residential neighborhood where there's a lot of people coming out of a bar late that could be mugged. I think it actually 
increases the safety of the space versus decreases the safety of space, in my opinion. Number uh, for two, the spirit and the intent of the ordinance is to create orderly development and create a safe sight line. And I think by putting it tight to the property line, it actually increases the safety because you don't create a negative space that can be hidden in. Uh, and spirit um, or the uh, character of the neighborhood, I think is absolutely met by uh, the fence being tight to the corner. All right, is there a second? Second. Johannesson seconded that, okay. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Will the clerk please call the roll? Just for C. We're just talking about C right now. Board Member Callahan? Aye. <clears throat> Grants Korsh? Aye. Hutchins? Aye. Ingram? Aye. Johannesson? Aye. Softly? Nay. Wang? Aye. We have six ayes and one nay. Okay, so notwithstanding staff recommendation, that variance is granted. Now let's do variances A and B, which deal with the trellis. Is there a motion? Uh, yep. Oh. I, I move uh, staff findings for variance A and B. There's a motion to move staff findings. Is there a second? There's a second. There's a second. Um, any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Board Member Callahan? Aye. Grants Course? Aye. Hutchins? Yay. Ingram? Aye. Johannesson? Aye. Softly? Aye. Wang? Aye. We have six ayes and one nay. Okay, that, those variances are denied. And now we'll move on to variances D and E, which have to do with the setbacks for the outdoor, outdoor dining area. Is there a motion? Mr. Softley? I move to, <clears throat> I move to approve the variance E to allow for dining in the eight and a half foot front yard setback. Okay, so you wanna take this separately than D? Any together? I would prefer that. Okay. I don't know if anyone feels it's that fine. Way, Let's just do it. So E, you're, can you give some findings for that? Yeah, I think that the uniqueness of the property is situated in a neighborhood um, requires it to use more of that space available on the non-residential portions of the of the building uh, for the outdoor dining and service, and I don't see any harm then to the neighborhood uh, that extends on the street frontage along 4th. Um, I think it is within the spirit and the character of the neighborhood that utilizes commercial nodes at the intersections, um, and I don't think that, uh, I don't think it's out of the character of the intent of the ordinance. I don't think it causes harm to the neighborhood. Okay. Is there a second? Second. There's a second by Ms. Wang. Any discussion on the motion? Will the clerk please call the roll? Oh, this is just for E, correct? Yep, just E. Just E, thank you. Board Member Callahan? Aye. Grants Korsh? Aye. Hutchins? Aye. Ingram? Aye. Johannesson? Aye. Softly? Aye. Wang? Aye. We have seven ayes. So notwithstanding staff recommendation, that variance is granted. Now on to our last one, variance D, which is the 20 feet of resident, residence district um, d uh, area, which is to deny it. Is there a motion? Mr. Johannesson. Thank you, Chair Barry. I'd like to make a motion to approve the variance uh, based on the uniqueness of the property and the position of the building on the property. Uh, with the building, if the building would have been on the north side, uh, there would the reflectivity setback would not be an issue. Uh, I believe it, it doesn't do any harm to the neighborhood, and I believe it stays in character in the neighborhood. Okay, is there a second? Second. Ms. Wang seconds, and is there any discussion on the motion? 
Mr. Softley. Thank you, Chair Perry. Uh, is there any interest in considering conditions to help soak up the noise through either vegetation or um, minim reducing that setback from 20 feet to a different number based on the, sh the noise, the proximity of neighboring residential uses? Well, I think the motion is um, there. Let me rephrase then. Thank you, Chair Perry. Uh, I am not in support of that motion because I think there should be conditions established okay. to help mitigate um, some of the noise to a zero lot line usage on the north side. Uh, but I'd love to hear if other folks have comments on that because I am generally supportive of granting the granting the variance. But I'd like to see a condition. Sure. Can I ask us? Yep, Ms. Wen. Um, I, I guess I just have a very straightforward yes no question for staff. We have zoning or, or noise ordinances. Okay. Grants Korsh? I'm going to vote in favor because I do believe in the, in the business um, commercial aspect of this, but I'm also very concerned about the emotional status of your neighbors and how they are doing. And I'm just hoping that you can look to um, your financial bottom line and do some creative thinking that maybe it's not necessary to have the midnight happy birthday happen outside and that there could be some, and, and noise restrictions are absolutely appropriate and that's, that should be in, implied. Um, and, and, but I guess I'm just gonna, I will vote for it, but I'm gonna beg you to really consider your neighbors properly. Ms. Callahan. Um, I would also be in support of attaching some conditions, and I'm curious if Vice Chair Softly has any suggestions. But I'm generally in favor of approving the variance, but I am interested in exploring the idea of conditions. Well, I think, uh, you know, without doing site planning for them, I mean, I think Arborvitis is an easy one to, to grab onto, though I personally hate Arborvitis, but it is a plant that grows in a relatively narrow diameter and does achieve height, and it does soak up noise. Um, that said, I don't want to tell them what kind of plant to, to plant. Uh, that would also achieve the purpose of, of creating a, a couple feet of buffer between the fence and uh, and the, the lot line, or I'm sorry, from the use and the lot line. Um, so I think it would be wholly appropriate to say a tree of a diameter of roughly three feet or so uh, as a condition uh, to the approval. But. Like I said, I don't want to get into site planning and tell them exactly what needs to be planted. I, yes, and I don't think we really should be in that situation. So um, unless you have something more specific that is not um, telling them how. Well, I would appreciate help from staff if they have any suggestions on how to phrase a very general requirement for a, a deciduous tree or a deciduous shrubbery that would. Um, Can I just, uh, sorry, Brad. Um, I just think, I think what I get concerned about if we delegate vegetation, then let's say next year it becomes a coffee shop or whatever, and or whatever business it becomes, and either A, they're stuck with vegetation there, or they'd like a different vegetation, they gotta grow them all over again. And um, to address the sound issue, um, I'm not an acoustics expert, but, if I say that you can't sit five feet from the fence, but I can sit six feet from the fence, my voice is still gonna carry. And I'm sorry they sang happy birthday, whatever, right? Um, and and the, the noise ordinance to me is something that can be addressed if there's issues. Um, I just think, um, I, I don't agree with, with what you're proposing as these conditions, basically. That's all. No, I, I appreciate that. I'm happy to let the vote take place uh, as as uh, moved. Second. I, I think we already have it. <laughs> Does it have it? Okay. We have a second on that. Appreciate your enthusiasm. Yeah. Let me just say, uh, Chair Perry, thank you for letting me entertain the discussion on, on sure. conditions. Sure. So we have a motion before us, and we've had some discussion. Would the clerk please call the roll? Board member uh, Callahan? Aye. Rand Korsh? Aye. Hutchins? Aye. Ingram? Nay. Johannesson? Aye. Softly? Aye. Wayne? Aye. We have six ayes and one nay. So notwithstanding staff recommendation, that variance is granted. 
and we are done with all the variances associated with this property. Good luck with your project. Uh, if you have questions, you can see staff. Let's move on to uh, our next meeting date, which I think is the 26th. So do we have any other updates? Nope. Our, yes, Mr. Softly. Chair Perry, I have to admit that I've been calling Mr. Ingram by the wrong name for the entire time he's been on the board, and I want to apologize for that. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> okay. Motion to adjourn would be in, in, in order right now? So moved. Second. It's moved and seconded. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 We're adjourned.